Läuft. Hey, welcome. So, um, this is a talk about CMake. Um, I gave this talk a few, ye few weeks ago at the um, C++ Now conference in Aspen. Let's get started. Um, it, to be, uh, one warning in, in the beginning, this is not an introduction. So this is really um, about using CMake effectively. This is of course not working. Is it? Anschalten. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why um, why I give this talk, and especially I gave this talk in uh, at CPP Now, which was previously called BoostCon, um, because I wanted to have I wanted to tell the Boost community um, that the way you use CMake uh, affects your users, and especially when you're a library developer, and the way you use CMake that includes not using CMake at all, right? Okay, um, you r maybe remember uh, last year John Kalb was uh, at our community and he said, um, he gave a talk about, uh, about the, the history of C++ and there was a question from the audience um, about newer languages like, like, like Rust and he said, uh, making a better language than C++ is easy. I can do it in five seconds. Uh, I just take C++, remove the template spe specialization for vector bool, done. Um, <clears throat> okay, but, but, but CMake and, and C++ today, because we have, um, we have also new languages coming up and we also have new build, system com um, build systems coming up, but uh, the, the position of, of C++ and CMake are somehow similar. They both have a big user base. I would say they dominate the industry. Um, both languages have a very strong focus on backwards compatibility. They are both um, very complex and feature rich. Um, well, CMake is known, um, C++ is known as a multi-paradigm language. I would also say um, CMake supports multiple paradigms. You can use it as a, as a language processor. You can use it as a build system configuration tool. It also comes with CTest and CPAC. Um, so multiple, multiple, multiple tooling paradigms, basically. Um, both have a very sometimes bad reputation. Uh, they, I've, I've heard the quotes bloated and horrible syntax referring to both of them and also both have some not very known, not very well known features. Um, but I think um, forking CMake or creating a new build system, um, I think this is uh, where this will lead to. Right? From time to time in my presentation, I have a slide with a dark background, and this is when I present uh, guidelines. Um, and, and this one here, and this one here, I want to say that CMake is code, um, and that means use the same principles for your CMake code and modules as for the rest of your code base. What that means, um, everybody has to know for himself. Um, if you, for example, care about um, not repeating yourself, also st structure your CMake files in a way that, yeah, you, you don't have to repeat yourself. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the ugly language. Um, CMake is organized in three different ways. Um, when we have directories that contain a CMake lists.txt file, this is um, the entry point for a build system generation. Right? We can add subdirectories with the add subdirectory command, uh, which then also need to uh, contain a CMake lists.txt file. Uh, then we have scripts. Scripts can be executed with the minus p command line flag. So we run CMake minus p and then the name of the script file. Um, this runs CMake in the just the the, um, the language processor of CMake, but it will not generate a build system, and therefore also not uh, commands that are there for build system generation, like um, um, 
at executable are not available. Then we have modules which can be included with the include command. Um, they are located in the CMake module path, which is a CMake variable that contains a list of directories. And depending on where the, the, the module is included from, whether it's from a directory or from a script, uh, that means in the module only certain commands are available. We can generate custom commands with the um, yeah, <clears throat> sorry, this was, uh, in, in CMake, uh, in the CMake language we have uh, commands and um, the arguments of the commands is a list of separated strings. Um, and we have, we have different kinds of commands. We have the scripting commands that change the state of the command preprocessor and we have project commands that um, create build targets or modify build targets. Very important uh, is that commands are not expressions. So you cannot execute a command inside an if condition, for example, because even the if condition is a command. Okay, and yeah, and, and commands do not have return values. Um, there's only the, the convention that commands can um, create variables at the call side of the command. We have variables. They are set with the, with the set command, and they are expanded with this uh, dollar curly brace syntax. Um, in CMake, the only data type is a string, and um, there's a convention that lists are semicolon separated strings. Uh, some newcomers of CMake sometimes stumble upon the, the fact that environment variables are, are not CMake variables. Unlike in, in make files, um, a variable in make is the same as an environment variable. This is not the case in CMake. And um, if we have a variable that is not set and we expand it with a, a dollar curly brace syntax, it expands to an empty string. And this sometimes also leads to uh, surprises. And it's therefore better to avoid variables. Uh, the CMake supports the CMake language supports two types of comments. Um, you see here um, there's the the single line comment which is introduced with the hash, and there's also multi line comments which is not very known and not very well known. You see here the command um, uh, the the highlighting engine in my slides does not recognize them. Um, multi line comments are introduced with hash. Then with a bracket and any number of equal signs and another bracket. And they terminate with um, a bracket, the same number of equal signs and another closing bracket. Uh, and this um, allows, and it, yeah, has some nice property. If we now introduce um, a hash in line three, then line three will turn into a single line comment and also line nine will turn into a, a single line comment. So the whole block in between um, can be with just one single character be enabled or disabled and multi-line comments can be nested, right? If we, if we just use a different number of equal signs here. Um, Another thing about the language, CMake has generator expressions. This is the syntax here with a dollar and angle brackets. Um, for the for the command uh, for the for the CMake language processor, um, this is just a string, which is then evaluated during build system generation, um, and therefore it's not supported in all commands, obviously. Um, sometimes you get, you, um, you get the question, is, uh, are generator expressions available in the if command? Of course not, because the if command is evaluated during um, the, the language processor and not in the build system generator. So this is only in, uh, allowed in commands that affect targets in some way. And of course we can create custom commands. Right? Um, there are two ways of creating custom commands, uh, one with a function and another one with a macro. And uh, the difference between a function and a macro is the same as in C++. Right. 
<coughs> one interesting thing here is when we create a new command that replaces an existing command, um, the old one can still be accessed with a underscore prefix. Okay. So we create a function here. We call it my command um, with some some uh, input arguments um, and um, variables that we set. Uh, between function and end function are scoped to, the, to this function unless we set them with a the keyword variable uh, parent scope. So you see here this, um, this output variable um, is set in the, in the scope where the function is called uh, and the, the name of the variable is the value of the output variable. And then we can call them like this, right? My commands like, like any built-in command. Inside uh, a function, um, we have the variables that we call um, in the argument list here. And then we also have argc, which is um, the, the number of arguments. Um, argv is the, is the, um, uh, the total um, list of arguments. Argn is the um, uh, total list of arguments that are not bound to a name yet, like for example minus uh, input and output, and then arg0, arg1, arg2, uh, up to arg9 are also um, uh, bound to the um, a specific argument here. Okay, another way to create a, macro, uh, a command is using the macro command. Um, the difference here is it does not add an extra scope and um, it does not define variables but uh, replaces those, those strings here. Right? Dollar curly brace is not uh, expanding a variable but it's simply text replaced. Um, there is a, is a difference um, when you when inside the command you check for something um, is defined, then this is not defined because it's not defined as a variable, it's just replaced. So now you know how to create custom commands. You know it can be used as a, um, as a, um, as a function or as a macro, but when to use which? So the guideline that I give you. Um, to create a command that wraps another command which has output parameters, then use a macro. In all other cases, use functions. Okay, so now you know how to how to create uh, custom commands, and at some point you may realize actually it was a bad idea to add that command. So what do you do then? Um, you can um, remove the command, but maybe then you see that it's now you all you, uh, used all over the code base, so everything breaks. Um, you would need some way of deprecating a command. So, like we just said, we can wrap our command with a macro. Um, we simply uh, issue a deprecation, me deprecation message, and then inside call the original command, right? And um, because it's a macro, because we wrapped it with a macro, it now has the same side effects. And we simply forward the, the uh, command, uh, the, the list of arguments. Clear? What about variables? We also added some variables and we decided actually having them was a bad idea. We want to remove them or we want to deprecate them. Let's say we have this variable here called hello. So um, in CMake there's this interesting command called variable watch. We can tell it which variable to watch and uh, what callback to call. So we create a function, we call it deprecated var, um, and inside the function we check the access and if it was read access then we issue a deprecation message. So, so every time someone references the hello variable, uh, it now gets a warning. But variables are so CMake 2.8.12. Uh, modern CMake is all about targets and properties. Who uses CMake uh, 2.8.12 or older? <laughs> hmm, not so many. Good. Everybody else uses uh, three or newer? 
Three dot eight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about targets and properties. Um, see in this example here, we don't have any variables, right? So we create a library called uh, called foo, and it has some source files. We link some dependencies. And then depending on the platform, we add some source files and add some dependencies. And uh, if you use uh, earlier versions of CMake, very often you see the pattern that uh, you, first you create a list of, um, of source files, depending on the platform, you append some values to the list, and you also have a list of, uh, of uh, li link libraries where you append some variables. And then in the end, you create add library with that variable expanded right and if you make a typo um, well it just expands to an empty string and you don't get any more error message this one here is much more much more robust so guideline avoid custom variables in the arguments of project commands as you saw in the previous slide it's absolutely absolutely not necessary to have variables in um, project commands, especially custom variables, of course, you need to sometimes um, dereference some, some variables that are provided with CMake, but there's no need to, to set your own ones. And that, of course, also means don't use file glob, right? It sets a variable, so you don't, you cannot use it. And uh, using file glob has, has other problems. Uh, the problem is that CMake is not a build system. It's a CMake, uh, it's a build system generator. So uh, in a build system, I would say globbing is not a bad thing, right? Because it uh, makes, makes your lists, uh, makes your definition right compact. And if you then trigger the build system, you evaluate the globbing expression. But in CMake, when you trigger the build system, the globbing expression is not evaluated. Yeah? It's evaluated during the build system generation, and then the actual build system does not contain the globbing expression, but contains all the expanded variables that was current when uh, you triggered the, the when, when you triggered CMake. So when you add a file in the um, in the project, and then trigger the build system, CMake has no uh, the build system has no idea that a file was added. Right? Unless you trigger CMake explicitly, but you don't want to do that all the time. So it's better use file glob in uh, cases where you, that you directly trigger. You can use it in CMake scripts, because CMake scripts you trigger by calling CMake, but um, in, the, in the build system generator you don't trigger the globbing, uh, and therefore you should not use it. Okay. Um, Targets can be imagined as as objects, right? You have you have constructors like uh, add executable and add library. You have uh, member variables that are the the target properties. There are so many I cannot list them on this slide here. And then you have member vari member functions that access or modify um, the the member variables. Those are the very generic ones. Get target property, set target property, also get property and set property with a with a target keyword, and then the the specific target ones um, like target compile definitions, target compile features, um, target compile options, target include directories, target link libraries, and target sources. Oh, forget those commands here. The, there's absolutely no need uh, to, to use them or, or know them. Those commands here operate on the directory level and all the targets that are created in, in that directory will inherit some properties. But this um, has a strange side effect, right? And it makes it, e makes it hard to understand, so it's better not to use them in the first place. Okay, um, let's have some example how such a member function can be used. In this case, we have a target compile features. So for the target foo, we set, um, we, we call target compile features. We have the keywords public and private here, and we have some values in between. 
Um, what this does is it tells CMake what compiler features um, we want to use for this target and CMake then decides what command line flag for the compiler will be necessary like um, yeah, setting the, setting the um, version standards uh, in this case it would probably be C++11 um, so, so the, the member function um, target compile features will add um, this string here to the compile features and the interface interface compile features properties and it will add this string to the target property compile features okay um, well use this use this to tell CMake about um, your your requirements okay get your hands off uh, CMake CXX flex so what what do these properties actually do? Um, we have some some properties that are prefixed with interface, and some properties are not prefixed with interface. So whenever we have a non-interface property, that defines the build specification of that target. And whenever we have a target property that is that starts with interface, then that means that defines the usage requirements of that target. Okay, build specification means um, those are the requirements for building that target itself, and usage requirements means those are the requirements for any target that links against this target. Okay, and all those uh, member functions like uh, target include directories or target uh, compile flags, um, they and they support those three keywords here the private the interface and public the private means uh, the non-interface property will be um, will be populated interface means the interface property will be populated and public means uh, both will be populated so target link library is, um, is a little bit um, wrongly named that's for historical reasons because in the past it really um, only affected the link libraries but today it also affects um, transitive requirements it may actually means that one target depends on a library right so all the include directories etc are transitively um, propagated to dependent libraries and therefore, it also means you only need it for direct dependencies because all transitive dependencies will then be populated by CMake. So, um, what, let's go into more detail what this actually does. Target link libraries foo with a public bar colon colon bar and the private uh, cow colon colon cow. This adds bar to the link libraries and the in interface link libraries uh, property and it adds cow only to the link libraries property but because it transitively um, propagates it also effectively adds all the interface properties of bar to the corresponding property and the corresponding interface property and it also effectively adds all interface properties of cow to the corresponding property I say effectively here because that's not what it's what this command actually does but it's only um, uh, evaluated during build system configuration because this is a generator expression so it runs not in the not during language processing of CMake and it also adds um, this um, generator expression here to interface link libraries uh, this is important because when we statically link then the compiler not only needs to know about the, the direct dependencies but also about all transitive dependencies so it needs to it needs to link also the the private ones <clears throat> so and you also can have targets that act as pure usage requirements those are the, the library type interface. So here we can create a library, give it some name, and we give it the library type interface. And we, get some, we, we can set some uh, compile definitions that um, are necessary for this, for this 
uh, library. And uh, whenever someone links against bar, it means it will not actually link, but it will just propagate those user requirements. So, also one note, uh, don't ab abuse um, user requirements. Um, use them really only uh, when something is really a requirement. Uh, for example, wall is not a requirement. Um, you, you may think it will, be, it will be nice if everybody uses wall, but it's actually not a requirement to use your library. So compile, uh, the, the code will compile just fine without that compile flag, and it will do exactly the same thing. So this is all nice, right? Uh, managing your own projects like this. But what, what if you have um, third-party dependencies? So when, when a project uh, in your project, you want to use some external project, you include it like this. You call find package, um, the name foo, you can give it, um, you can require some version, and you can also say whether it's strictly required or whether this dependency is optional by using the required, uh, required keyword here. And then in your own code, you can link against um, uh, a library that was imported um, by this uh, find package command and imported libraries always use them like this with a namespace name colon colon and the name of the target Oops. This is stupid. <laughs> okay so where does this um, what does this find package do here uh, you may know about uh, find modules in CMake right and very often you um, you ask people how to actually write, um, you know, you, sometimes I get questions from people, how do I write those find modules? So here's an example, right? Uh, this is for some library foo. Um, we first find the path for the include directories, then we find the library, and then we have some necessary boilerplate. Um, we mark all those, uh, those two variables here as advanced, so they don't appear directly in the cache editor. Then we use some um, CMake provided function to handle the requirement keyword and the version checking. Um, and then if the target is found, and uh, if the dependency is found and the target with that name does not exist yet, we can uh, add a library, uh, add an imported library, and we set some necessary target properties. Uh, this one is here very, very basic, this find module. It does not handle multiple configurations like debug and release. does not support um, transitive dependencies, right? This does, depend on, does not depend on anything. And it has some, um, some other shortcomings. It does not uh, support different architectures or platforms. In reality, files will look much more like this. Um, I don't know, can you read this from the back? No? Okay. Uh, but the, the point is that uh, I want to show that this is probably way too complicated, right? And this is also a lot of guessing involved here, right? Um, so I see here maybe I can read this. Uh, what was this? I uh, don't remember. Yeah, it has some special case. Yeah, you know, here. Uh, the, the the first comment here is slightly slightly off the right. Um, that means sir. It's a laser. You, you can use the laser. A laser. Use the force. Yeah. yeah. You see here this comment here. This means it's a special case for OpenBSD. Um, but it's a lot of a lot of guessing involved here, right? And and the problem with this is um, the when the project was built, in this case it's PNG, uh, the compiler knew how to build the project, right? And then the project maintainer threw away all this information. And now in, in the CMake maintainer now has to make guesses what the actual requirements were. So it, it's very important. Um, use find modules for third-party libraries that are not built with CMake, right? For, for stuff that is built with CMake, there's a much better way. But actually, this is not accurate because um, there are 
projects, much too many projects that are actually built with CMake and that still provide, um, or st for them it's still necessary to use um, find modules. And not only that, um, there is also Qt for example. Qt is not built with CMake, but um, it supports another way. You don't need a find module for, for Qt 5. But it only works for um, dynamic linking, unfortunately. So this is more, more exact here. Use a find module for third-party libraries that do not support clients to use CMake. And please also report this as a bug to the authors. <laughs> okay. So a better way is when you, when you uh, have a CMake project, export your library interface. Right, so let's say um, we create our own library, we call it foo, um, we, we link against the library bar, and then we, when we install the library, yeah, we see here we um, install it to destination, the, uh, the runtime destination bin and the library and archive destination lib. That means on Windows the DLL will be in the bin directory, the .lib will be in the lib directory, and on, on Linux, uh, the .a or .so will both be in the, in the lib directory. And you see here this export, right? So we export the definition of that target in this export set here. For you there, here, okay? <laughs> um, so, and then we also install this export set. So name of the export set, we export it in this file here, in this namespace, at that destination. Okay. Um, the other thing is we want to support um, this, this version, version number that uh, clients can check whether they use the right version. There is a CMake provided module here, um, which provides a command write basic package version file. Uh, so we create it with our current version. We set the compatibility. So we say when we break the, when we change the major version, that means uh, breaking in the API. And then we install both uh, the file that we could just um, just generate. Uh, no, we in install the file that we uh, just generated here above, and the one that is here below. Right, that's the foo config. And in the in the foo config, we simply include the one that we just generated in the previous slide. No, this one here, this file here. Okay, that's that's also uh, quite a number, of, uh, qu quite an, an amount of boilerplate. But this one is straightforward. This is exactly the same thing that we uh, would need for for exporting any project. Uh, and then uh, once we exported this, then um, just using find package will uh, will be sufficient to to import the the library. But um, we need to be careful that sometimes the the interface that we um, that we use during building and the one that we use during installing is not the same. Right. So, for example, when we build our library and uh, some other library links against that library from the same build tree, uh, it will need to have the um, include directory in the current source tier and also in the current build tier as the include directory. Right. But um, and this is an absolute path. Right. This uh, full source tier variable. Um, and of course, once we build the project um, and once we install the project, this is no longer the path where the include directories, where the include files are located. So we use this generator expression here in the build interface, use this plus this and in the install interface, just use include. Okay. So this is how we export the library um, dependencies. Let's wrap that into a package. CMake comes with a tool called CPack, um, with, uh, which is very simple. Um, you just have the CPack config.cmake where you set some variables 
but you can also set those variables in your cmakelists.txt file and then include the cpack module which will take all those uh, variables, write them in the cpack config and then uh, also uh, give you a build target called package with, which will then simply call cpack. So a hint from me, write your own cpack config and also let cmake generate one and in your own one include the one that is generated from cmake. Uh, and this one here is, is very interesting. Um, I mean, you include the, the the one that is generated from CMake because it has all those um, those package definitions, uh, like exporting the targets. But in your own one, you can set this variable here. This is very interesting. According to the official documentation of CMake, this is a list of four values. But it's not. It's a list of quadruples where the first one is the build directory, the second one is the project name. I don't really understand why the project name is necessary because it's, it can be actually deduced from the build directory. It's in the CMake cache. Then we tell which project component um, to pack. And then the fourth one is the directory where this um, project should appear in the package. Um, another change that we need to make in our um, in our CMake file, we set a debug postfix, uh, which means when we create when we um, create the debug libraries and the release libraries to the same directory, they will not collide, right? And then we create separate build directories for debug and release, and then. Step number three, uh, use the following CPAC config. So I simply include the one from the, from the release build. I can also uh, include the one from the debug build. And I set those two quadruples, right? Um, the first one is the path to the build directory. So you see, I take the two build directories, debug and release. The project is foo in both cases. In this case, I want to package all uh, components and the directory will be the root of the package. So using this I can now create a single package that contains um, my library in both debug build and release build. And the interesting thing is that the, the targets that we exported previously uh, will also contain the information for, for debug and release. So our clients uh, in their debug build, they will now use our debug libraries and in their release build, they will link against the release libraries and this, all this is handled by CMake, so this is nothing that needs to be handled explicitly. So, we now know how to create packages, we know how to put um, dependency information into that packages, we know how to import packages. So this is all the necessary uh, information that we need to create a package manager in CMake. What is this? And there are, there are a couple of approaches of creating package managers, either in CMake or on top of CMake, but they, they all um, are deeply, deeply involved into CMake. And I think uh, this is not the right approach. So I give you the, the um, what I think are the requirements for a CMake pay based uh, package manager. A package manager should support system packages. So if, um, for example, Zlib is installed uh, using the package manager of my system and the project um, can use the version, it should use the version and not uh, download uh, another copy. It should support pre-built libraries, so installing from an archive um, and, and putting it in a known location. But, and it should also support building dependencies as sub-projects. And, um, and also a mix and match, so it, so it should be able to take some packages from the system, other packages uh, pre-built and other packages uh, built as sub-projects. 
most important thing, it should not require any changes to my projects. So it should not provide uh, a special command that can be used in CMake to um, register the, I don't know, provide special commands or uh, provide special build targets or it should also not uh, take care of downloading the pen, uh, dependencies during the configure step. Right? Should just use uh, idiomatic CMake. Remember, as I said, how to use external libraries. I said always like this, right? So a quick recap: um, if foo colon colon foo is a static library. And that library also has some dependencies to another library. Um, you may know that on the, on the compiler, on the on the link line, they all all those dependent libraries need to appear. So, what should I write in this case? Sorry. They have to appear in the right. Order. They also have to appear in the right order, right? So, in this line here, uh, with the information that foo. Uh, has some dependencies. What do, do I need to? How do I need to change this line? So let's say, let's say the library foo depends on bar. Um, what should be in this in line three in this case? Nothing. Yeah, this uh, should exactly this. Yeah. But imagine uh, foo is a header-only library. What should we change in this case? No. Nothing, right? Uh, I think you understand when I say always what I mean, right? <laughs> okay. So, always like this. Uh, also, um, I, I did not mention this before. Uh, does everybody know what this colon colon means here? Why do why do I use uh, colon colon when I link libraries? Provide the namespace that it doesn't collide with somebody who is locally foo. Uh, the, um, the 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 reason why this is the case is actually also historic. Previously, when um, when I just use foo here, what CMake does uh, is. Um, it assumes that the library exists on the platform, so it passes minus L and then the name of the target to the linker. And w let's say when you make a typo here, you will get an error during linking, so very late in the in the build step. Um, so colon colon something never can be a file name. So this has to be the name of the target. Right, and if a target with that name does not exist, you will get an error message during during configuration. Okay. Somehow automatically added by the by by CMake, or how do you, how do you um, create that that because it is some kind of namespace. Right. So when you create an when you when you export. Um, when you when you create an export set, when when you install an export set, you can specify which namespace it should be. Right, and when you import the library like this, you always refer to the namespace name. Okay, so um, let's quickly go through all the the, the possible possibilities here. Um, we use this, right, and we have a system package. So um, find package should simply work and we, if, if we exported the target like I've previously shown um, then we have the, the target name in the namespace so this should just work right so our system packages work out of the box pre-built libraries so we we have a pre-built library we we download it we put it to some known location but but CMake does not know the location right so we need to uh, put the the library that we download into the CMake prefix path, or we need to set the variable CMake prefix path in such a way that it contains all the possible locations where the downloaded libraries might be. So after we set this variable here, this also works, right? But if we have a sub project, let, let's say let's say the target. Um, the, the, the foo is um, defined as a project 
uh, as a build target in, in a different subdirectory. So let's say we have a top level directory. Here we, we have a branch somewhere where find foo, find foo is executed. Um, a find package foo is called. And um, some, somewhere down below here, we define um, the target foo. So we need to make sure that uh, two things are the case. We need to turn find package foo into a no op. Um, and we need to make sure that uh, foo colon 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 foo uh, refers to the actual target foo. So um, on another requirement here, um, or a guideline, when you export foo in the namespace foo, then always also create an alias foo colon colon foo using using this here. You add, add library with the alias keywords uh, that refers to the actual build target. Okay. Here, uh, with a dark background because it's a guideline. So, and that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing is we need to take, need to make um, find package into a no op when we call, um, when we call it with a uh, library as an argument where we know that it will be built as a sub project, as a, as a, um, as a dependency of the, of the same super project. So, um, imagine we set. Um, this list here, uh, which contains all the projects that are built as subprojects. And then we override find package as a custom command. And um, inside the command, we check whether the first argument appears in that list. And only if not so, call the built in function add package. Right? And otherwise, we simply do nothing. So this is uh, the, the top level CMake file that um, you can generate by hand. You can write it by hand or you can, um, if you imagine a package manager that, um, that has a, a list of dependencies as input or some, some, some JSON file and then uh, gets all this uh, build definitions uh, and uh, and uh, build requirements uh, from some web service, or um, it uh, calculates it using satisfiability or whatever. Um, in the end, uh, the package manager will have three lists, a list of projects that are installed on the system, a list of projects that um, should be downloaded as binaries, and a list of libraries, a list of projects that should be built as um, sub-projects of the project. Okay, so for the first set, uh, the system packages, we don't do anything. Um, for the second set, the, the pre-built libraries, the package manager can download them and put them in the prefix path. And for the third set, the, the stuff that we want to build as sub-projects, we add it to that list here. And then we simply added them as subdirectories. And when now down below, deep inside app, someone calls find package foo, then we see here it will not do anything. And hopefully inside foo, um, the foo colon colon foo alias is created. So when we then link against the foo colon for colon foo targets, um, it will also just work. Um, the question is, can I simply just check for target exists? Uh, the problem here is, if I go back, we don't know in which order they appear here, right? So we don't know whether, whether um, let's, say, let's say we have not only those two here, but we have maybe 10, right? And let's say the entry number nine depends on the first entry then there's no problem, then because when this is executed, the first one is already known. But let's say target number, uh, the, 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 the item three depends on the fifth one, then the target does not exist yet, right? So, so during, um, during 
the command execution, during the script execution from CMake, the target does not exist yet, but it will exist during the build system generation. So therefore, therefore, this one is really necessary. We have it. We have to give it the information that we have first, and then let it load all the all the projects. Did this answer the question? Okay. So as I said, um, how does it work? Um, for system packages, find package foo will either find a foo. Um, mo uh, find module or um, the, the foo config um, and in either case the target foo uh, the target foo colon colon foo is imported if it is a pre-built pre library then it will also use either the find module or the find package um, and it will find either of them in the prefix path and also in both cases uh, the target is imported if it is built as a sub-project, then find package does nothing, and um, hopefully foo colon colon foo is an alias. Okay. Um, yeah. Question. Related to this find package, my experience shows that to make this working in, we are at Microsoft, so work it with Windows, mm -hmm. it pulls your hair out because it becomes uh, very ugly. To use find package uh, because there is no package manager on Windows, there is no real directory, and the other thing which I find very disturbing is when uh, the developers work with sandboxes. So several times the same source they exist, and you and CMake with this find packages uh, caches all the packages into a single user cache, and then the sandboxes start. Start to talk to each other. Okay, so the m mul multiple comments here. Um, the first thing is uh, find package apparently is complicated on Windows. Um, I do not fully agree because the problem is not find package, right? When when you have um, <laughs> the problem is uh, no. actually no. this will, this will also Get the comment. Okay, this will be addressed in the next talk. Um, so the, the the problem is, of course, Windows does not have a package manager, and uh, we we don't have a, a package manager for we don't have a cross-platform package manager for uh, CMake projects. Like I I explained what my requirements are, how a package manager should look like, how it should work, but it doesn't exist. Right, so there's no way. Um, there's currently no way of a tool that downloads all those dependencies. But once you have them, then uh, the re the responsibility of find package starts, right? And a find package, I can say, works very well on Windows. So when you when you already have the dependency, either installed on the system or installed in the in a known location, or um, so, because I, I, the reason I say it works very well is uh, find package that um, so from from CMake um, can relocate packages. When you use, for example, package config, package config cannot re cannot be relocatable, right? Uh, when you when you create something with um, when you create a package with CMake, you can install it to any location. Um, and uh, in, in many cases, CMake will find it out of the box. And if it doesn't, uh, there are easy ways to, to give it the information where to find this stuff. So I would say find package works very, very, works very well. Um, now I talked a lot about find package and forgot about the, the other... Uh, the sandboxes, the, the right. Then, then there was a comment that... Um, CMake caches when you when you have multiple source directories and um, or multiple 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 times the same project that um, and you call find package that CMake uh, creates a user uh, specific uh, cache. Um, this is not done by C by this is not done by by um, find package. Um, find package simply caches um, the results in the CMake cache. Which is built uh, built directory specific. There is something like um, a um, user local uh, user 
uh, specified a uh, user um, specific hash, but this is only um, affected when you when you export the export definition using the export keyword. So in in this case here that I show that I've shown previously, I use the export definition to install it into a package. There's also a way to um, to uh, register it in a user directory, right? And uh, this affects find package. Um, yeah, if to, to avoid the problems, don't use it. Right. I mean, I mean, in my examples, I didn't show it because for, for just for creating packages, it's not necessary. Yes. Uh, you said that there is no package manager which would fulfill your needs. Um, did you look at Conan? Uh, Conan will be mentioned in the in the next presentation. I did not look at it, but I just heard that it does not satisfy all those requirements. Right. Um, but but I'm also very excited to hear in the next presentation about Conan because to be honest I um, never found the time to, to look at it. More questions about CMake or can we continue with ctest? Right. So ctest is another tool that um, comes uh, bundled with CMake. Uh, using it is actually straightforward. I just give some um, best practices that um, that yeah that are sometimes helpful. Um, in um, yeah, C test uh, supports uh, scripts fi script files for for dashboard scripting, uh, and then those are executed with C test minus s and then the name of the script. In the scripts here, we set the the source directory of a project, the binary directory of a project, um, some um, we, we set the CMake generator whether it should use uh, launches or not. Uh, we set compile flex and uh, tell it which um, coverage command and memory checking command it should use. We can also tell it to use um, uh, memory checkers that are built into the compiler, like the thread sanitizer or undefined um, behavior sanitizer, etc. And then, once we've set all this, we we simply start um, the 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 CI job. Um, we call configure, then we call build, then we call test, then we call coverage, then we call mem check, and then we submit all the results to to a dashboard. Right, so th this is a, this script here is a is a very nice way or yeah good good place to add um, things um, that are not really project specific. Like for example, I said previously, uh, w all is not a requirement for your project, but maybe you want to make sure that your CI server uh, has all warnings disabled has all warnings enabled then this is a good way uh, to add it, right? Okay, guideline. Um, C-test scripts are the nice, are the right place for CI-specific settings. Um, keep that information out of the project. What I've also seen previously um, was a project that adds special test cases for um, for uh, for running the test with Valgrind, right? So you see here, it's absolutely not necessary because the um, C test mem check already does that, right? So keep all those information about those tools better out of the project. Um, another um, hint um, in in C test when you run. I mean, when you when you integrate C test in C make by by including the C test um, C make module, um, it provides you a build target called test, and when you when you build that build target, it will simply run C test. But it's much more powerful to call C test directly. For example, you can run multiple jobs in parallel. This is not done by default. Um, this is a very nice flag here. 
because uh, C test by default just gives you statistics of how many tests failed, and but you want to see the the actual output on the failure. So this output, this command line flag does that. There's also an environment variable where it can be set globally, and this is another nice thing. You can match the tests that should be executed by a regular expression, and especially when you run uh, when when you have um, third party projects built with a subdirectory, you probably want to execute your own tests, not the ones uh, from the from the dependencies. Um, so therefore, a uh, good guideline is to, to use prefixes or use a naming convention for your own tests. For example, all, prefix all tests with your own project name. And if all projects do this, then it's very simple to, to filter out um, filter out uh, tests that, are, that you don't care about. So, guideline. Follow a naming convention for test names. This simplifies filtering by regular expressions. This also is an interesting. Um, sometimes, as a library developer, you want to make sure that um, something fails to compile. Right? You have, you have uh, some code that should be uh, that should not work in, in certain conditions or give you an error message. Um, and when you when, when you uh, make the test in such a way that uh, it is successful when it fails to compile, the problem there is it may fail to compile for the wrong reason. Right? For example, you want to make sure that um, your um, your uh, static assertion. Uh, triggers, but instead the test fails to compile because the include directory was set wrong, then the test will be, uh, well, will be successful because it fails to compile, right? So uh, instead, of, instead of setting the test property that it should fail, um, instead we set the test property what regular expression the output should match. And um, of course, when you when you simply want to grab the error message of a compiler, then the test will be very compiler specific. But for 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 static assertion messages, um, you are in control what what output appears there. Okay, so in this case here, we add a library, and we exclude it from from all. So when we run make all, it will not be built by default. And then our test actually is to call CMake with minus minus build and the target foo fail, um, yeah, which will then try to build the target and hopefully it it fails with this uh, static assertion message. Um, when you cross compile for a different platform, um, then there is this interesting variable cmake cross compiling emulator. Um, it's a good place to set this variable in the toolchain file. Um, an example, you can set it to wine when you cross compile from, from Linux to, to Windows. Or uh, when you cross compile to ARM, you can set it to, to Kimu. Um, and uh, another thing here to, to run tests on another machine, you can set cross compiling emulator to a script that uh, takes the arguments, copies the binary to the other machine, and executes it there. Uh, question is whether this is documented. I think so. So when you, when you look at the reference uh, documentation for this variable, then um, it will tell you that what it does, right? But, it's probably probably not um, a good way to look up things, right? When you have a, when you have a, when you have a problem, then it's not a good way to to order the solutions alphabetically, right? <laughs> but uh, the interesting thing here is um, the the um, the test command is prefixed with this variable, right? But only if CMake recognizes that uh, your test command is a build target. Make sense? Too fast for me. Okay, so let's, let's go back. Um, we have, the, the, uh, 
This is a simple signature for add test, right? So we give a, a test has a name and it has a command, right? And you see here in this case, command is foo under bar test. So if this, if foo under bar test is uh, an executable that was added in CMake, so then CMake knows that, um, then CMake knows the actual location of that. Right? Because, because it may appear in some subdirectory uh, depending on the configuration in a debug or release, etc. So, um, so the, that's a very good point. You can use the generator expression, but this will break it. Right? Because, I mean, you, this is just, here you just give it, a tar give it the target name. Right? So, um, so then um, CMake sees this, okay, this is a build target, sees this is an executable, uh, and knows the location where the, um, where the executable is, so it can set the, the correct path for that executable, and it can also prefix it, it with um, the cross-compiling emulator. You can also use a generator expression that gives you the absolute path of the target, right? So um, then uh, the, the, the in the generator step, this will be expanded to the absolute path of the target, but at the place where the test is added, this is just an absolute path and the information that this is a build target is lost. Right? And this will then break this Right, because because the the absolute so it now con it's just a variable that contains the absolute path and it no longer can recognize that this is a build target and therefore it will not automatically prefix um, the the test command with the cross compiling emulator. So it's actually better not to use generator expressions in this case. But my experience is that in this case, will not find the proper. No, the solution is really this. So the solution in this case is not to use generator expressions for the for the target name. But this is only the case if um, if this is really the first argument, right? Let's say, for example, if um, if you if your if your test is um, is uh, starting Python um, with um, then the path of the Python module that you compiled as a build target. In this case, it's better to use gener the generator expression so that you have the actual path, right? But for for the test itself, for the test driver itself, it's better not to use the generator expression because otherwise the cross compiling emulator will not be prefixed. Okay, this is an example how of a bash file that uh, takes the first argument, copies the um, copies the executable over to a different machine, executes it, and then terminates with the with the exit code that yeah that was executed that, that the target executed with. Okay. Some more info about cross compiling. Um, when you cross compile, um, you will need to specify a CMake toolchain. And this is about the extent that uh, a toolchain should have. Right? So we, very often we set the system name, actually, always. Whenever we cross compile, we need to set the system name of the target platform. We sometimes also set the system version. Right. And then we specify the C compiler, C++ compiler, resource compiler, uh, in the case of Windows. And um, we set a root path where we should look for, uh, for packages or programs and libraries and include paths. And then we set the mode. Um, so um, those, those modes here mean um, for program for program library and include directory, um, whether we want to search in this directory or the directory of the system, right? Never means never in this directory, but always in the system. Only means only in this directory, 
and never in the system, and we can also set both, so it will uh, try both. Here's an example how we set the CMA cross-compiling emulator. Right. So, as I said, this is about the extent. If you have a toolchain file that is more than this information, it's unnecessary complex. Right. And if you if you look at, for example, at the official Android toolchain that is provided with the NDK, it's way too complicated. Okay. Don't put logic in toolchain files because a toolchain file should target one particular. Um, target platform. If you want to target two different platforms, use two different toolchain files, right, and have have the exact information for this for this um, target in there. Don't try to reuse some information. Yeah. Yep. Well, you mentioned that you should never read CMake variables inside the toolchain files. Was, um, it gets interpreted several times, and sometimes it may uh, Okay. What was it exactly? Um, I just read some CMake variable. Okay. Yeah. Reading reading CMake variables in toolchain files. I mean, the toolchain files are are um, read very early in the in the processing. Uh, in, in the in the in the configuration mode, right? So we first read the toolchain file um, even before. I think no, it's actually the toolchain file. I think is read when the support for languages is checked or so, and so not many variables are set there at this moment. So several times, and um, the behavior changes from each time to time. So okay. So uh, I just wanted to add this information. To your um, sentence, um, never put logic into the right. chain file because. So there was another str an, another strong argument for not putting logic in two chain files. Was that the summary? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, because sometimes, I mean, the, the point was that sometimes toolchain files are read multiple times, so the behavior can change um, uh, if you put logic in there. So for each try compile. Okay. Because it has to, if you, if you um, provide a special compile in the toolchain file, right. it has to, to use try compile to, to get all the features the compile. Okay, so the, the comment uh, was that the toolchain file is read every time uh, CMake executes a try compile, and um, you can execute try compile explicitly in your code, but also um, CMake will sometimes under the hood. So when you enable a language, or if you if you just use the project command without specifying any languages, that will automatically enable both C and C++, and this will um, execute try compile several times. Okay, uh, this interesting chapter here, static analysis starts with a guideline that ends with a question mark. Uh, what's, what's your opinion about this? Um, treat warnings as errors, yes, no? Yes. Yes? Anyone says no? no so it, depends. it depends. Okay, I have, a, I have an interesting question. How do you treat warnings as errors? What, what do you do to treat warnings as errors? Switch the compiler flag, warning error. Yeah. I turn on the compile flag, W error. Anyone agrees? Open your eyes and fix I like that one. So, um, f before we answer the question how to treat one, how to how to treat warnings, um, question: How do you treat errors? Right. So, so I would say uh, when you have a when you have an error locally in your build, you fix it. Um, when someone makes a pull request that introduces a build error, you reject the pull request. And when you have an error on your release branch, you don't make a release, right? So this should make it easier to, uh, to answer the question how to treat warnings, right? Like this. And I even would, would say this, um, if you pass W error to the compiler, then your compiler treats warnings as errors, which means you no longer treat warnings as errors because all you get is errors. 
Yeah, you no longer get any warnings. So I like this one here. Uh, no, the next one. But this is more uh, to 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 make my point stronger. <laughs> you cannot uh, you cannot enable W error unless you already reached zero warnings, right? Otherwise, your build is broken. And you also you cannot increase the warning level unless you already reached. Uh, unless you already fixed uh, all of the warnings that are introduced by that level. You also cannot upgrade your compiler unless you already uh, fixed all new warnings that the compiler reports at your new warning level. Um, interesting case that I had just recently, I, um, I use Arch Linux. On Arch Linux, uh, you now get GCC 7. Um, on GCC 7, there's a new warning uh, enabled by um, I think W all um, that um, explicit no implicit fall through is now a warning, <laughs> right? So so if you use if you use W error, build is broken just by upgrading the compiler. Um, it means you also cannot upgrade dependencies uh, unless you already ported all your code away from any symbols that are now deprecated, and you can also not. Uh, mark your own stuff um, that you use internally as deprecated, unless you already, uh, unless you um, you change all the places where it is used, so it's no longer used. But it's no if it's no longer used, if it's just internally, there's absolutely no point in making in marking it deprecated. You could just remove it. Okay, so which renders the compl the whole deprecated uh, annotation useless. So I like this one better. <laughs> So, very often you you uh, you develop in cycles, like in, in like in sprints, for example. So I would recommend uh, though th such a process here. At the beginning of a development cycle, uh, you allow new warnings to be introduced, which means you can increase the warning level or explicitly enable new warnings by by changing the compile flags. You can update the compiler. You can update dependencies or mark symbols as deprecated. So, and then, after this phase here, uh, you make sure that you burn down the number of warnings. So, when 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 a change um, when there's a change in the number of warnings remains constant, it's okay. If it uh, if the number of warnings goes down goes down, very good. If the warning increases, that should make the build red, right? And then you you um, basically burn down the number of warnings until you reach zero warnings, and um, you can repeat the whole process. So once you have such a process, uh, and you 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 bring down the number of warnings with all the compiler provided warnings, you can think of new ways to introduce warnings to your build. So here are um, a couple of tools that can introduce uh, additional warnings into the build. There's Clang Tidy, which is a um, linter tool that is part of part of Clang tools. Um, then there's CPP Lint, which is um, I think the, the predecessor of, of Clang Tidy. And then there's also include what you use, which analyzes includes and, and tells you um, which includes can be replaced by a forward declaration or which tools, uh, which includes can be removed because they're not necessary. Um, but very often it also should, um, it, may, it uh, warns that you should add includes that it just depend on transitively. And uh, it, it's better to explicitly uh, include all your your dependencies because um, then you can much more easily, uh, easier refactor the code because in the, if the include is removed in the, in the um, header that your own uh, file just depends on transitively your file breaks and um, therefore it's better to, to include all your dependencies. Um, Clazy, uh, this is a Clang wrapper from from the KDE project. Um, this concentrates on uh, C++ and Qt anti-patterns that uh, decrease performance and memory consumption. So uh, if, you, if you use Qt, you should probably use it because it has very, um, has many Qt-specific uh, warnings. 
like for example um, calling um, because Qt uses copy on write in many places um, calling uh, non-const functions on temporaries will detach the object and create an unnecessary copy and um, very often um, you call the uh, non-const function even though you actually uh, make don't make any changes a good examples are range-based for loops uh, range-based for loops implicitly call begin and end and um, and if your if your project if your um, if the object that you call begin and end on is not a const object then overload resolution will pick the non-const overload of begin and end which will then uh, detach the cute comp uh, container question why don't you remind extenders like misra c um, the, the question is why why not misra c or something like this um, <coughs> I show this uh, because um, those are the things that I can that I know how to integrate into CMake, right? Um, I'm sure. Okay, I heard that there are other there are other standard tools that um, that can check other warnings, but those are the the ones that are easy to integrate into CMake. Okay. So we have those uh, target properties. Um, uh, for example, um, I mean, you see here, lang is a placeholder that can stand for C or C++. So for example, there is a, um, a target property called CXX clang tidy. Um, you can set it to um, you can set it to the the path of clang tidy, and um, and uh, CMake will then uh, for each compilation unit, call clang tidy using that path, um, and basically, actually, it can contain more than just the path. It, it can also uh, contain some some flags. So there's there's a there are language um, there are target properties for uh, C and C plus plus clang tidy CPP lint include what you use, and then there's the another one called link what you use. This is not uh, language specific because it affects linking. Um, this gives you a warning when you link against the library that you do not actually depend on. Right. And um, each of those target properties is initialized with a, a variable, uh, same name, just prefixed with CMake. And the interesting thing, um, interesting thing with that is um, this variable, of course, can be set from outside the project. So when we configure a project, we can we can set the uh, let's say CMake XXX uh, CMake CXX Clang Tidy to uh, the path of Clang Tidy semicolon uh, minus fix, for example. Then it will it will run um, Clang Tidy. With that compile flag, uh, with that command line flag, on each compilation unit. Okay, those tools um, very often report diagnostics uh, not for all files that they analyze, but only for the current source file plus the associated header file. Right? Question. The tools do they cre uh, create new targets? You run or uh, run the, every time you run the question it? whether whether tools uh, whether those tools create no ta uh, new targets no this is just um, for for each compilation unit uh, when, whenever you compile something um, the tool runs so it's basically it's basically the um, the, the build system knows the the compiler command line will not consist of the compiler plus the arguments, but the compiler command line is actually CMake, uh, which knows which tool to run and which compiler to run. So it will then first call the tool, then the compiler. And the interesting thing is, before it first calls the tool, then call the compiler. Uh, interesting thing is, you can use clang tidy with minus fix, so it will actually compile invalid code. Because first clang tidy will fix it, and then the compiler will execute <laughs> the compiler the, the fixed one. <laughs> so for example, we, I don't know if tidy has a model for it with what you use, or if they have a fix for that. So you could, in some cases, just don't 
using loops and it will be automatic. Uh, so, um, no, no, a cl clang tidy and uh, include what you use are uh, two separate tools. Tidy is not doing that yet. <coughs> it, those are two separate tools. So cl clang tidy has just uh, linter warnings, like for example, here you use um, you, you have a string, you call cstr uh, on the string and pass the result to an, to a function that takes a string. So uh, clang tidy will tell you here you because because when you when you create a cstr, uh, you get you get a c string literal that can be passed to the constructor of a string, but this will create an unnecessary copy. So clang tidy will tell you just remove the cstr and remove the unnecessary copy. This is the the, the kind of things that clang tidy can fix, and um, include what you use works in a way that it um, it analyzes your files and um, look at all the includes and find which of those are actually necessary or not. So if the include is missing, uh, cling tidy, uh, include what you use doesn't help. Right? It, it does not know where those includes are located. It can only decide whether it's necessary or not. But also can give the suggestion to replace with the forward declaration. It can make the suggestion that um, it, it, it sees, for example, that there is an include, but actually a forward declaration would be sufficient. Then it suggests to remove the include and add the forward declaration. <clears throat> so, um, many of those tools report just warnings from the current source file plus your associated header file. Right. Um, but that means that header files with no associated source file will not be analyzed. Right. So then uh, there's a way um, you can sometimes set custom filters, uh, which is just default the associated header file, but you can you can extend the filter or relax the filter that it will uh, give warnings from uh, from more header files. But now the problem is uh, if those header files are used in multiple source files, you will get the same warnings multiple times. Right. So this is actually a better guideline. I think uh, I heard this in a presentation from uh, John Lakers the first time. Um, for each header file, there is an associated source file that includes this header file at the top even if that source file would otherwise be empty. If you follow that guideline, then um, then you, you will get uh, all the warnings from each header file exactly once, because you compile each source file exactly once. Okay. Did you propose this on the boost column? <laughs> uh, yes, so, uh, I, had this, I had this in my slide. And then, then there was a comment, what about uh, header-only libraries? Because um, if I add source files to those libraries, then it will no longer be a header-only library, right? And I mean, I can actually, in, in CMake, I would, for header-only libraries, I actually would prefer interface uh, libraries because there are pure user requirements and not something that is actually built. But then where to put the source files, right? You generate them. You could generate a source file for each header file. But when to build them? So I, I do not want to make my my header-only library into a non-header-only library just to make sure that it compiles those empty source files, right? But what I could do is, for example, compile those source files in a test. Yeah, exactly. That would, that would be nice. Right. Create a specific project, specific target, which is part of the test. Right, I can create a specific target, which is maybe not even built by default, but I can just build it to make sure I get those warnings here. Yeah. Um, this one is a, is a nice utility. Um, let's say you have a, a project where not each header file has an associated source file, but some of them do. Um, this is a a uh, reusable snippet that can simply scan a directory for source files, header only, uh, source files, header files, compare uh, what is, which uh, header files have no associated source file and uh, simply generate them. You can maybe extend 
this here to include uh, copyright or whatever, go crazy. Good. Um, like I said before, it's um, it's good style to enable warnings from outside the project because enabling warnings should not be a uh, um, project specific requirement. It maybe um, is enabled on the CI machine in the in the C test script, uh, or you can also add it on the command line. So here, for example. Um, on the command line, I set the compiler, the C compiler to Clang, the C++ compiler to Clazy, because Clazy is a compiler wrapper. Uh, then I call CMake and I pass um, Clang tidy and include what you use on the command line. Um, and you see here, for example, pass Clang tidy and I can enable uh, some checks. So I disable, I disable all the checks and then enable just the re readability checks. And for include what you use, uh, this is the way I can set a mapping file because uh, include what you use sometimes cannot distinguish between uh, public headers and private headers. So it will tell you to include bit slash function dot HPP uh, from the standard library, but you actually want to execute uh, to include function. So not the not the private headers from GCC, but the public ones that are uh, specified in the C++ standard. Good. Excuse me. Uh, we talked about um, wrapping the CMake command in the shell script and uh, told me. You can you can also wrap the CMake command in a shell script or uh, create an create an alias for for CMake. I, for example, uh, on my own machine, I have an alias called CNinja, which calls uh, CMake with the Ninja generator by default. You can also add something like this. But also make but in this case, you need to make sure that CMake can be called in multiple different contexts. So you need to distinguish whether you use CMake as a build system generator or as a command processor. Because when you run uh, CMake minus um, uh, P, because you want to execute a script, then it's, it's not valid to specify uh, um, a generator with minus G. So so in my, um, on my machine, C, uh, CMake is actually not uh, an alias for something, or, or Ninja is not an, uh, C Ninja is not an alias for CMake, but it's a, it's, a, it's a function that checks the arguments, and if it's not P, then it adds G, something like this. Yeah. Uh, can I tell CMake to, uh, to apply these things like flying tidy or include what you use only to certain files? Question, um, how can I um, make sure that this is applied only to certain files? Um, so for uh, this is the way how you can uh, control it from outside a project, but then it applies to the complete project. Um, from inside the project you have more control. Uh, you can you can you can enable Clang tidy on a per project basis. Um, and there was also a uh, requirement to add, um, to get added even on a source file basis. Uh, that's, that's not implemented yet. Okay. okay. Interesting thing is um, enabling this, en enabling compiler uh, in enabling additional warnings like like Clang tidy with this um, works in all IDEs because it simply CMake simply affects the compiler command line, so there is no special IDE support needed. And um, so it, I so imagine you use Qt Creator uh, and um, you will get Clang tidy warnings appearing in your build output. You can. Uh, Click the click the warning. It jumps directly to the source location. Um, so this I recently uh, recently C line announced that they now support uh, Clang tidy integration. I would say that's not necessary. <laughs> so it's, it was already possible before. 
right? And uh, if you have an IDE that understands fixed hints from Clang, then it will out of the box understand the fixed hints from Clang, cli Clang tidy. But the big difference when you have IDE supported, it runs it as you type, and it already suggests. So, for example, C Lion is uh, you don't have to run an extra target to, to check it in the whole file as you type. It already tells you it will not pass your tidy configuration, and it gives you even an option replace it with this one. Okay. And uh, it uh, makes you even more easier. Right. That of course makes sense. So when when um, the comment was that. Uh, C line, it's now, um, it runs the checker as you type. And uh, before you even hit, uh, hit compile, it will already tell you that uh, it will fail and make suggestions uh, how to, uh, what to replace it with. Completely agree with that, but yeah, <laughs> good. Um, that was basically the end. Thank you. <laughs> Any any more questions? Yeah. That's maybe a little controversial. Does it have to be this complicated? <laughs> <laughs> what exactly do you mean? I, I've dipped my toes into like other languages and ecosystems. Okay. It seems like <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I can come back to the, I mean, the question is, does it have to be this complicated? Uh, does it have to be this, uh, this feature rich and, uh, and, and, and that complex? Um, I would say you can create an alternative to, to CMake on a weekend. So, so after a weekend of, of, of hacking, you will have uh, a solution that, is, um, that supports all your requirements and compile your code. It will be very fast. Uh, it, you will be happy, right? You will not convince anyone to use it because they have other requirements. And then you, you start extending it, extending it, extending it, and you will, add some, you will end up with something equally complex. And, uh, I mean, this is this is exactly the point why why I said um, CMake and C++ are in in similar positions because it's the same thing with C++. Compi making a making a compiler for for an, your own language is also not that complicated, especially now with with LLVM. Uh, it gives you all the, the the necessary infrastructure and building blocks, uh, and many people do it. And this is also the reason why we have so many new languages. But I highly doubt that C++ will be uh, affected by this. So, follow-up question. So far, whenever I've looked up CMake online, I had a hard time finding any good tutorials or like guides for modern CMake. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, correct. Um, when you, uh, when you, when you look and when when you have a problem, uh, you you Google for a solution. Uh, you will either uh, end up at Stack Overflow, or uh, in some old version of the CMake documentation, right? CMake mailing list. Or the CMake mailing list, yeah. And uh, the, the the problem is um, the the answer on Stack Overflow is probably not following the best practice anymore. So I agree, it's, it, it's hard, but um, the, um, if, you, if, you don't, uh, if you don't Google for your problem, but directly go to the uh, manual of the latest CMake version, it's, you, you will find much better results. So the, the someone should write a book about it. Yeah, someone should write a book about it, I completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> yeah. For the biggest there problem is the channel, there's a guy 24 7 online called Ngladis, you can ask him everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. One more thing, this to this file glob, which you said it should not be used. I said the file glob should not be used in projects. I didn't say it should not be used. I said it should not be used in projects. I must admit I'm using it heavily. <laughs> it's okay. And I really like it. Um, how, what, what shall be used? Uh, Especially, for example, if you have to integrate uh, 
several uh, compilation tabs which include code generation. And uh, the code generator doesn't uh, tell you what will be the output of the code generation. And you have nested of these things. Uh, then the only way I came around it is to use PyClub and add, add custom command and then add custom target and then wrap the whole thing uh, with functions around. Yeah, <laughs> it's an ugly workaround. Yeah, I have some. I have some. Um, I doubt that there will be, if especially for um, for custom code generation. I doubt that there will be a better way. I have some ideas how that could be improved, but with the current version of CMake, I don't see any any way other than explicitly listing all the files. There is no way to bind it to an expression. I mean, the, I mean, the, I mean, you can, um, you you can somehow shift it to an expression that is evaluated during build time, um, um, but then you also don't know whether to trigger it or not. Right? Yeah, I mean, you can you can call. That's what my solution. Yeah. That I I, li I grouped my sources in the way that I I have I, every directory is a library, and there is a stem file in the directory, and then the directory content is compared to the stem file, and if there is something newer, then it gets uh, right. But but the 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 pitfall with that is you basically create your own uh, build system on top of CMake. Right, and it's and it's and this will just lead to lead to trouble. It's better to to follow the CMA conventions. To list always the sources. No. I mean, the, the users. I mean, what you can. With this solution because they can just add files and magically they appear. No, they don't. They, they they appear when the when you retrigger the generator. That, that's really a problem. Um, I have some 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 more information if you're interested in the in the in the future or if you maybe even want to contribute would be great um, so this is my my personal wish list um, I have prototypes for 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 the stuff that I present present here but I have no uh, idea when or whether at all I will be able to, to finish that. But if you, if you like those ideas and you would like to contribute, please talk to me. Um, no disclaim, uh, absolutely no guarantee that this will ever be added to CMake. Um, something I actually started a very long time ago, pre-compiled headers as a usage requirement. I think this is the, the, the only correct way of adding pre-compiled header support to CMake. This is how I want to uh, how, how I want it to look like. It's a it's a command target precompiled headers um, where you can add the list of headers uh, to uh, any project. Um, public private uh, interface exactly the same way as all the other user requirements. So what what CMake should then do in the back end is calculate a list of headers per configuration and per language for the build specification of each target. And then it should generate one header that simply includes all those headers and tell the build system to pre-compile this generated header and also tell the build system to force include this header. And because it's force included, there are absolutely no changes required like include uh, some special header at the beginning of each file. This is not necessary. So in the, in the source code, it will make absolutely zero difference whether pre-compiled headers are supported or used by the compiler. So, and the interesting thing is here, for example, in, in boost libraries, for example, boost ASIO could add um, boost slash ASIO.hpp uh, as a interface uh, a uh, user requirement for uh, the uh, interface target. So everybody who links against Boost ASIO would automatically pre-compile all the, all the Boost headers. Question? As I, as I said, um, this is the only one 
the, the only valid approach of adding uh, user. Um, sorry? It's, uh, it will be available if you give me your email address and I give you instructions how to, how to implement it. <laughs> <laughs> so now to, to answer your question um, regarding custom code generation. I think this uh, is the way uh, we should implement it. Because CMake at its core is actually language agnostic. And all the information how to build C or C++ or Fortran uh, is actually scripted, right? And um, so, so uh, the, the, there are CMake files that contain rules how to how to call the compiler, but the the knowledge uh, the the model of those languages this is hard coded, and the model is you have one source file. So each source file produces an object file, and in the end, all those object files will be linked together. Right? This works fine for both C and C++ and Fortran and others. Um, even D, right? Uh, CMake can be used with D, thanks to Dragos. <laughs> um, but there are languages that do not fit into this model, right? So. Um, idea if we allow the output to be yet another source file of a known language then um, we could have we could directly support things like protobuf Qt resources or other IDLs um, because CMake would compile uh, this language first it produces C or C++ and then it knows how to compile C++, it will be an object file and then those will be linked together. Um, there's a list from that I took from Wikipedia. Um, I don't know all those languages or can, can guarantee that those work, I have no idea. But um, the, I mean on Wikipedia there's a page source to source compilers and apparently those languages can either be compiled to a C or C++. So those would all be Available to CMake if we if we if we relax the requirements for of this uh, compilation model. Anyone interested? <laughs> no. Uh, this is another thing. Um, find package with uh, package conf. Um, find package in CMake has two modes, uh, like I discussed previously. There's a package mode and there's a config mode. In the config mode, um, CMake searches for, for a find module, and in the package mode, CMake searches for um, foo.config. No, the other way around, probably. I have I have mixed, I don't, can't, dis, can't distinguish them. Either, either it searches for a find module or um, uh, config.cmake. Um, I would like to see a package config mode in addition. So in this mode, CMake would parse uh, package config files and then generate imported libraries per package. Uh, because um, package config, the implementation of package config is actually quite simple. Um, what makes it so complicated is the fact that it's written in C, so it has all this. Um, it needs all those classes for uh, linked list and, and hash map, etc. And in, in C++ we have those things in the standard library. Then um, the next thing that package.conf does is um, reducing the dependencies to an actual command line. But this is something that CMake already does. So implementing the find package mode for package.conf actually involves mostly parsing package config files and the rest is already there. Uh, something I would also wish is um, a declarative front end to CMake. Um, everybody hates the hates the the CMake language. Um, some people say they hate CMake, and what they mean is they hate the declarative and uh, they hate the the procedural front end of CMake. And those uh, who do not. Um, hate CMake or say they actually like CMake, they like it despite the front end. But no one uh, likes it because of the front end. Um, so, and th there was, uh, years ago, there was an approach of adding Lua as an additional scripting language to CMake, but the way it was implemented uh, was um, in, in the Lua mode, it took uh, command by command, translated to a CMake command, and executed on the on the 
CMake language processor. The problem with that approach is that uh, inherits the all the limitations from the CMake language processor, like functions cannot have output, um, can, cannot have return values, etc. Um, I think a better approach would be to um, to port the CMake processing mode uh, to the Lua virtual machine, and then do the other way around, right? So translate CMake commands to Lua, and then execute them on the Lua machine, Lua virtual machine. Um, so this would be nice for uh, for modules, but for directories, I would prefer a declarative front end. Um, for example, uh, libucl is uh, is a is a declarative uh, language that can execute macros that are implemented in Lua. So I think this would be a nice approach. <coughs> yeah, if you have uh, if you have your own ideas, you can please tell me. Good.